Welcome to It's Not Just Business Talks with Sonia, where we get down to the real business of how great leaders dug through their own trenches and climbed some epic mountains to get where they are today. Now let's get started with the show. I'm here today with Jennifer Jeffco, somatic therapist holding space from preconception through family dynamics. Her work is interwoven with pre and perinatal birth psychology, attachment theory, polyvagal theory, am I saying that right? Mm-hmm. Thematic and spiritual psychology, neurosensorimotor reflex integration, didn't say that that well, cranial sacral therapy, mindfulness, and conscious studies. Wow, Jennifer. She has been holding space for individuals and families for over 28 years with the last 10 years embodying her work as a doula and midwife assistant, attending over 400 births. How beautiful. How a culture births holds supports during postpartum, part, I can say this again, how a culture births holds support during postpartum and early childhood reflects the physical, emotional, social, and mental space of the people. Her work opens to professional training as awakened somatic therapist parent educator, and pre- and perinatal practitioner. Yes. Yes. Nailed it. Did I get it? Oh, (laughs) yay. Wow. (laughs) Jennifer, that's just an incredibly uh, long rap sheet of incredible work. Wow. Um, So can we just start by me asking you, what does that look like? What does your day look like? What do you do in practical terms? So in practical terms, I, I guess we'll go to what is a somatic therapist? Mm -hmm. So soma is the body. Mm -hmm. I think we all have bodies (laughs) and we all have body stories. And um, so I go deep into how our stories, our life stories, how we store them in our body and how we either, it brings health and pleasure and joy and wellness, Mm -hmm. but also looking into those parts that we hold that really cause a lot of dysregulation and fragmentation and bring about sadness, feeling isolated, lonely, um, not a part of, and how it holds and how it can manifest into disease. And may I ask, you know, if I can just go ahead and play the person, I I mean, obviously I have a little bit of familiarity with your work, but I'll just go ahead and act like the complete novice for the sake of getting as much information out of you as possible. Sure. Um, how, how does the body hold these? E- so I, uh, yeah. So yeah. I always, I have to get, I guess, kind of give an example. Sure. I think that's the best way. And um, with that is if you think about, say you walked out onto a baseball field, mm-hmm. walk out onto the baseball field, you're having fun, you're enjoying yourself and boom, a ball comes and hits you in the head. So yeah, yeah. (laughs) so there's that you've gotten hit in the head. So now you have the actual contact space, and then you have the whole motor response that took place when that ball came and hit you. Mm -hmm. And so the next time you walk on the field, what's going to happen in a motor response when you see a ball coming? I would say I'd probably freeze like it's going to hit me. Right, and you would actually probably play out the same kind of um, movements that you did the first time it hit you. Really? Yes. So again, so it's going back to in that moment that we experience joy or trauma, we have everything that comes in with that experience from a biochemical response, the way our body, our hands move, our organs, every, everything has a memory. Mm-hmm. And so when those stressors and there's a perceived life threat, again, we will have that biochemical response, mo- motor response, everything will play out again. Despite the fact that the same circumstances are not prevalent. Exactly. Which makes sense. I mean, certainly in the case of trauma and stress um, mm-hmm. that is either chronic or, or severe or you know, complex. I think that um, it makes it, it probably served a purpose at the time, but it yes. no longer serves a purpose. Right. Right. And so how do you work with that? I, I'm very curious. Okay. 
So how do I work with that? So my specialty is I move in the field of pre and perinatal birth psychology, Mm -hmm. which is we have memory from the time we were conceived throughout pregnancy, through the birth process, through, you know, all the way through till we really started talking. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, we have what we call implicit memory. Right. So even yeah. though we don't remember, we do, our, we, our body definitely remembers. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> and so for me is, you know, when I'm working with clients is really kind of meeting them where they are and then moving down this storyline all the way, just seeing how far we back, how far back we can go and where that mm-hmm. memory actually started, mm-hmm. where that trauma, where this behavioral pattern started to form and then work in unwinding it and starting to release the shock from the trauma. Because the trauma is the event, and right. all that, that biochemistry that was going on, motor response, then is held in shock patterns. And so it's the actual shock that, we, that moves when we react. Got it. So, and is that process... When you say so, so you're somatic, again, just playing complete novice here because I have some familiarity with some of these things. But um, do you do work on the body or, for example, I'm familiar with EMDR Mm -hmm. or um, Reiki or other similar? What how do you work with your um, patients or or clients? Mm -hmm. clients? Yeah. Yeah. So it's multifaceted. Um, You know, I can say sometimes we're on the floor actually rebirthing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we're doing a two chair process with a different form of EMDR, the tapping. Um, and then sometimes we are on the table with just holding space for the, the nervous system to unwind really on its own because it can. Um, so we tap in that way. So within a session, it can look each time very different. Um, sometimes you're doing two or three things. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is, is really just knowing your clients so well and really being able to know what resource needs to be used mm-hmm. in the moment. Mm-hmm. That's when the most profound healing takes place. So, well, I mean, wait, since you, you do care, you do work with such, you know, really the entire t- story timeline of a human, right. Mm-hmm. But actually, you know, from conception. So the whole, you know, and I know that you have, if I, am I, am I correct? You've also helped people through passing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So from conception to, or to, to birth to throughout their lives into passing, what a great, um, what a magical experience that would be. Um, do you find people who come to you uh, fall within a certain, because I want to get to the fact that you also teach how to do this, but, but, that come to you usually, uh, cause I'm making this up. They come to you in crisis or they're like, wow, something's just not working right. Or I'm having a lot of anxiety or whatever. And that's the, the entry point or how do how do you find most people present to you? I feel most people, um, most people are referral based because people try to explain what I do. Yeah. <laughs> and it's always like, Hmm. So it's a lot of referral base because again, people move through it. They start to see, they start to feel things just, begin to unfold for them. Mm-hmm. And that way of moving how they, you know, that, that knowing that it's not, it doesn't feel right. Something is impeding my ability to be more free moving in the world and mm-hmm. in relationships that is, is more uh, referral based. But those who come to me just kind of out of the blue, when I, when someone calls, it's always um, the, the somatic really stumps them it really kind of they take these deep pauses um because it is out of uh, you know out of traditional therapeutic realm Mm -hmm. and so uh, you know a lot of the times people just have to come experience a hundred percent and i i I would agree and i and i know somebody that works with you and i would i would second that um you know and i've had some very wonderful practitioners in my life where they've said, you just need to go experience that. And it's kind of, I want to say as a compliment that at first you go, this is a little woo woo. I don't understand what's going to be happening here. And here's what happens is it's the most healing experience you can have 
and going to the doctor and getting prescriptions to sort of suffocate or suppress, you know, the anxiety or the pain or whatever people are experiencing is not as once you experience healing on that level, it's just a completely different. It just, and then you can you can't say anything except for you just need to go see her. Um, uh, so do you do that? Could you have to be in person? How did the telehealth world happen during COVID? Do you have to do it in person? It's still an exploration. It is still an exploration um, because just as much as I am in the hands-on somatic, I'm so much about really teaching and education as well. Mm -hmm. Really understanding the storyline. And, you know, once you can really start to understand it and where it is in your body and how it's held, there's so much resourcing that you can do by simply us meeting online and, you know, so I, I even myself, I'm still exploring how much can be done online, how much needs to be done in person. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, again, it goes back to the individual. Mm-hmm. This is not a, a, a one, one size fits all by mm-hmm. any means, because we're all have our own ways of moving and processing. So I say on the most part, I do have clients, you know, like in New York that I see just online because I'm not going there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have some people because I have a practice here in the Portland area. I have one in Santa Cruz and we'll be now going down to San Diego. So right. wow. nice. Yeah, I know it was exciting. Can you come so, up to Seattle too, please? Yes, I would love to. And actually I'll be in Idaho. I have already started going to Idaho. Excellent. So, so we're, you know, again, it's kind of moving through that space, but I would say on the norm for my home, you know, for my home-based practice, I see my clients online once, and then I see them in person once. Mm-hmm. That is pretty the flow and rhythm that I move. And if not, I see them, I see typically clients twice a month. How did you get then? So was that the entry point for you in this type of work? Or did you start with, I, you know, the, the where, where did you, you know, uh, doula, you know, birthing, you know, where did you, where did you enter into this kind of field of work? Um, I think it was my birth, you know, Your birth. <laughs> birth. I was <laughs> born and then it started. <laughs> I was born and always had these questions of something's not right. Even as a little kid, just, and I love, I, I, I just love human, the body. Mm-hmm. I was a dancer, you know, I actually am still a dancer, but in the somatic world, not, you know, traditional to any type of traditional dance, but um, just loving the body, loving the outdoors and just, I guess I was a people watcher and a big observer and the human, and the just nature of humans, I w- was so intriguing to me. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, as I grew and went into, I was a, started off in kinesiology, again, anything to do with the body. Sure. Yeah. So kinesiology was my starting point. And then which led into getting into the fitness realm and, uh, then, you know, wanting to teach and moving into becoming a Waldorf teacher. And I oh, think becoming a Waldorf teacher was like this, ah, it was like the light bulb went off and I'm like, that's it. The, you know, just really um, moving into more of that deeper realm of the human spirit. Mm-hmm. And that was my first introduction into Steiner's work mm-hmm. and to how the womb space is held and how it moves with us outwardly. And it just has gone on from there. And I think I have hit every, you know, I've taught high school, then I went to middle school, elementary school, and then down to preschool. And, um, and then whenever, I don't know, I, you know, I decided to, for a while to, to kind of take a pause and move into the birth realm, because I really wanted to get into the pre and perinatal birth psychology. And I'm such a kinesthetic learner. I just said, you know, I need to go be a midwife or a doula so I can be hands-on in the birth Mm -hmm. culture Mm -hmm. and really be able to speak on it. And so I did it for 10 years. And now I've closed, you know, kind of, I've had my experience and I can speak on it in and out, up and down. And, um, And now the way I hold space for my clients, because I do understand the experiences in hospitals and home birth and just the energetics of uh, how this trauma moves with us and mm-hmm. how it shapes a culture is so profound. And-, and yeah, shaping the culture. I mean, that's just how we don't realize how one person carrying that story and, and myself, right. Uh, mm-hmm. Included everyone, <laughs> every, if you go into your day and you're, 
you subconsciously carrying some anxiety about something that's coming up or, you know, it's, and it's very unconscious most of the time, unless you're really checking in and paying attention, that set of thoughts and anxiety and what you're holding in your body is impacting how you're working with the postman and the baker and the, you know, and then that impacts them or pushes their, I mean, it's just sort of this commute, uh, communal wave, really. I mean, one person carrying one little, you know, so it's, it is really, truly fascinating. Yeah, it, and it is. And, you know, now moving in, you know, diving really deep into my PhD work and excited, you know, for my thesis work is just, um, you know, I, I, I am so grateful that I get to be in this place because with really these deep understandings and, you know, pre and perinatal birth psychology has been around for quite some time. I mean, it's, it's truly been around since, since man, you know, if we mm-hmm. look at um, a lot of the, the tribal communities, they understand it intuitively to where, again, we have moved out of the body and we're in the thinking yeah. mindset for everything. Yeah. Um, but pre and perinatal has been around for a good, you know, fifth, you know, 40 years. And, um, but still is so much in the background. Mm-hmm. We always, the conversation starts so much of adverse effects with children and maybe one, two, but the, you know, the focus is like, there's like this um, disconnect mm-hmm. with the storyline. And so, you know, my intention is to really, and there's so many beautiful um, colleagues that are out there, you know, really speaking in this field and do therapy in this field. But I feel as one within the um, technocratic community that can really bridge a gap with especially the pre and perinatal mental health community what did you say technocratic so technocratic so technocratic is is pretty much the way we move when it comes to how we see our bodies Mm -hmm. Um, and technocratic is just you know we're machine like we're parts of uh, we're, we're, Big word for a little old me. I mean, what are you talking? About? <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, tech, you know, technocratic because there's three there's three layers. There's technocratic, humanism, and then holism. And so you know, I think most of us move in the technocratic humanism feel you know realm. Um, but to truly be in that holism, that true holism of what that interconnected that we're energies. Interchanging with other energetic fields, um, it's truly holism, and um, so, uh, so yeah. My goal is to really be that gap between the three of them, you know, between education, between healing, um, because we do we have the mental our mental health crises. It's, yeah. it's, it's hard to even speak on at this point in time. And, you know, human. Do you, think, do you think, I mean, this is a genuine question, Jennifer, because I, I mean, I grew up in, in Europe and mm-hmm. in Europe when I was a child, it was frowned upon to get therapy. It was kind of that yuppie American thing that people did. You just don't talk. If you have a problem, you know, go to the bar, drink it away. And so we, I came to America and, you know, people were, I mean, even even 40 years ago, even 35 years ago, for someone to go see a therapist, there was something pretty wrong with them yeah. you, in my in my. That's, that was my understanding. Like they, they were really hurting, you know, they'd lost a family member or something. They right. didn't go because they were having anxiety or, so do you think that health crises have gotten worse or we're paying more attention to it or some combination of that? You know, there's never, there's never just one way, right? There's always multiple layers to that conversation. I feel there's a little bit of both. Um, I, I do feel that more people are coming out, the stigma of, you know, going into therapy is the, that belief is starting to, to peel away. Right. Um, but we have to look at it from, you know, again, multiple layers. Um, if we look at it from a mental health perspective and in, in relation to suicide, we can't say it's just because more are coming out because, you know, when suicide rates were here, the therapy, you know, again, there wasn't as much therapy, but there was still a, a movement that the suicide rate's not where we are today. So, so the suicide rate, and I haven't pe- personally paid attention, but there's a, a sharp in, in- Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
age and that's garden. all age groups that's teenagers adults yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's a really fascinating statistic yeah the we have here in the u.s we are we are one of the only countries that have and you know if you run this it's okay but or if you don't that's okay but we're one of the only countries that five-year-olds are committing suicide Oh my gosh, that's tragic. I mean, at rates that is, you'll never, you won't see it on TV, you know, um, but it's something has to change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we've all, um, tragically, probably been exposed to or known somebody or have a family, you know, that, so, I mean, it's a, it's prevalent. It's not just that one weird thing that that one uncle did, you know, in another, you know, it's, it's, it's prevalent enough that we're talking about it pretty regularly, actually. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> um, how how did this your own experience working with uh your practice turn into or is this how it happened did you start then wanting to teach and help other people grow into the same practice or how did that come about um no absolutely again you know it's all my own healing work that going through this whole process myself Mm -hmm. you know from all teachers that i've been sitting with for the last you know 15 years you know starting with with steiner steiner's work um, wanting to, to be able to first, again, being kinesthetic, having to experience it, knowing how to, how it works and mm -hmm. truly embodying it myself mm -hmm. now, you know, really ready to, to share it with others mm -hmm. so that they can also either one, you know, uh, see me privately or do the workshops that we have just coming in to do some self-exploration mm -hmm. in a group setting. And then, um, now moving into teaching. So those can come and professionally be certified in these areas in these fields i looked at the a little bit of the outline of you know your courses that you have and they're not they're no small potatoes you don't come in and learn something over a weekend and get certified this is several years of really intensive multidisciplinary uh am i correct really uh, practice i mean these people that are coming out of your programs are coming out into the world to do some great work you know, it's just and that is a, intention. Yes, yeah. it, and it's it's so much. The works is self exploration, mm -hmm. and how they embody it, how they experience, and it's that you know again to truly bring something out into the world. And what we you know the the huge component is how do we hold space for for others without projection, without mm -hmm. judgment, without you know all of that that fills ourselves just because of how we've moved and how our society is um takes so much time to unwind mm -hmm. and so we can understand that unwinding and understand our own story with such fluidity um can we truly not project onto someone else and allow them to have their own unbiased for the first time be able to find their potency to find out who they really are and what are their true beliefs versus the um, false beliefs, what we call double binds in my work. What's a double bind? Go ahead and explain that. That's yeah, so a, double, so a double bind are false beliefs that we've acquired because of either, you know, the birth environment, our, our early childhood, cultural society. And so a double bind could look like um, if, if I have needs, people abandon me. Mm-hmm. And people don't even realize they have that belief about themselves. And so this is, we base our life based off of our double binds, um, our beliefs about ourselves. Sure. Yeah. I mean, one of the ones I've heard, and I'd love to hear your opinion about this, is one of my colleagues and I were talking about it, is um, imposter syndrome. I'm going to get caught. They're going to find out that I'm not really legit, or I'm not yeah. really real, or I don't really belong here. Um, and I was laughing because I, I have, I have a little bit of that and I, you know, I, I, I don't know, we haven't really done anything about it yet, but I have a colleague and I thought that's so weird. Of course you belong here. What are you even talking about? But it was so inherent in him. Right. And it made, and it made no sense to me that he would feel that way, but yet here I am feeling that way sometimes, right. About you oh, know, family yeah. or whatever, like right. someone's going to find out I'm not really a mother. I, I really don't have this job. I'm not very good at it. You know, and so what do you what do you think about that double bind? Is that is that a double bind? So that so yeah, so you have that so the uh, um imposter, mm -hmm. right? There's a double bind up underneath that. Yeah. 
because this is the behavior, you know, we um, put on the mask. And so then there's a belief of why we feel we're imposter, like an imposter. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a double find that's that driving force. And then you can get even deeper in, okay, what's underneath that double bind? And then it goes down. An example is I'm just not good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and when we can get all the way down to that core belief and begin to repattern that belief into one that is true then our whole reality begins to shift. Back to that then. So how do you repattern that belief? And again, I know I'm familiar with EMDR. So is that one of the modalities? And is it back, like you said, the two chairs, the hand, the, those yeah. are all it's, parts of the process. It's all part of the process. It's just, again, there's no one way you walk in. It's how you walk in. It's kind of where I meet you and kind of how we move through that event or whatever you're moving through mm -hmm. is what it will look like. And I feel that that is the, the biggest um, challenge for um, the community to really wrap their head around because we're so used to algorithms and this is the way it's done, mm -hmm. where this work is so experiential. It's for the first time you being in a place where you are embodied and feel and get to move it and go to the depths that you probably never have gone and allow it to move forward and speak on it. And so the pace and the rhythm of our sessions are very slow mm -hmm. because the body has to feel safe mm -hmm. before parts of us will start to open. And the body is really the most, um, dense of all of the you know uh i mean it's the slowest <laughs> sluggish moving part of all of us we can change our mind mm -hmm. so very quickly and for it to materialize in the body it can take a really long time yeah because we'll think ourselves out of it <laughs> before it change before it yeah before it takes hold yeah so it's a practice right yeah. i just say you know this work is a practice it's a new way of getting up we practice every day you know, but it's how do we practice? How does yeah. our practice of getting up every day, being in this body, moving on this world, being in relationship, how is it serving us? Mm -hmm. Is it one that's serving us to trust and have pleasure and an empowerment and have this felt sense of unconditional love, speak our truth mm -hmm. and really see reality for what it is and be able to manifest and have beautiful, secure attachments? Yeah. Or do we get up and practice? and fear, and guilt, mm -hmm. and shame, and um, grief, lies, illusions, and false attachments. Well, I mean, and I'm just going to just volunteer. I do all, I do, I can do both <laughs> really well. I can go straight for anxiety as my morning mm -hmm. tea, or I can go into bliss. I, and we're human. That's the thing. Yeah. And the yeah. hardest thing that I have mm -hmm. around that is just holding space for that. Mm -hmm. Rather than because I'm kind of an all or nothing and a bit of a perfectionist. And I know um, that means that if I if I fall short by even just a small percentage, mm -hmm. I might as well throw the whole thing out. The whole thing is a failure. And so holding space for, you know, today I didn't do X, you know, and that's OK. That's right. actually a very. Uh, so, yeah, I can be. It's very about building relationships with those parts of you, because we do. We have light and shadow. Yeah. And light and shadow is there's light and dark is always going to be there. And yeah. so is looking at those fear, the guilt, the shame. How do you build one with a functional relationship with each one of those? Mm -hmm. So when you get up and you have these moments, there is that moment to be able to ground, pause, settle, you know, orient, do all these things and move in a way that's supportive mm -hmm. um, with that, because that fear and guilt and shame, you know, all of those are truly there as a guide. Mm -hmm. That means Mm, we're in guilt. We're probably not setting a boundary, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's all it's there for, but we haven't been explained that. Right. We, you know, we take fear, guilt, shame, all of that as one is this negative is bad. Yeah. As opposed to a, a clue. It's a clue. Oh yeah. It's just <laughs> your body saying, Oh, my stomach hurts. I just said that. Oh, I feel a little guilty about it. Well, why did I say that? Ah, cause I didn't set a boundary, mm. you know, or, Oh, I didn't speak my truth you know, those type things. So again, it's just shifting and getting away from the good and the bad, the right and the wrong, and start to experience your life 
with these parts of you that are there actually to be a huge guide versus mm -hmm. one that is so wrong or bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is to thank even those parts that are anxiety producing or sadness producing mm -hmm. because those are uncomfortable feelings experiences um and yet they're like like you just said like we said clues right in yeah. um, where where we need to navigate a little bit well fascinating stuff <laughs> and i uh really appreciate you taking the time to visit yeah. me today um I just want to wrap I want to do do, do a quick thing because you're people are going to want to know how to find you so Number one place to find you, is that going to be your website? That is my website, yes. Yeah, theawakenedmethod.com. Yes. Theawakenedmethod.com. And just actually add it to, to, be, to shed some clarity on that, why do you call it the Awakened Method? So Awakened Method is working to awakening to all who, of who you are, where you've been, and where you've come from. And, and, you, and, you, have, and you have a method. Yes, I do. So, so it is a method. Uh, and there is training. Um, yeah. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. I've been with Jennifer Jeffcoat, somatic therapist and founder of the Awaken Method. And um, thank you so much for visiting with us, including the jet. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, I appreciate that. Thanks for listening to It's Not Just Business Talks with Sonia, a real life podcast to inspire you. We'll see you again next time. And if this is your jam, click subscribe to get future episodes.